Welcome to the Low Carb USA podcast, where we seek to inspire you to help us build this community. I'm Doug Reynolds. And this is Pam Devine. So good morning, Nadia. I've Hi, got uh, Nadia Padiguana here with me, and she is with the what used to be called IDBM, right? Um, and it's now called the Fasting Method. So she works with Jason Fung. And... Um, has become very focused and involved with um, PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. And he has actually just recently uh, come out with a new book about that. So welcome, Nadia. Tell us a bit about your story, how you became so interested in this particular aspect of the whole metabolic syndrome problem and insulin resistance. And, uh, and tell us more about how that's, uh, what you're doing is helping other women. Thank you, first of all, Doug. So uh, very true. I, I work for the fasting method program. It used to be called IDM, Intensive Dietary Management. It still is. The company itself is still IDM.health. And our program, our fasting program, is an online program called thefastingmethod.com. And so I started working with uh, Megan Ramos and Jason Fung in uh, 2016. You, a funny story is I actually met Jason at one of your conferences. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, anyhow, long story short, I've worked with them ever since. And I work with people with metabolic syndrome. I have a long history of working with people with metabolic syndrome. I was trained as a naturopathic doctor. And as life would have it, I decided um, when I finished school to go back to my home country. So I went back to where I was born in Mozambique. I was raised in Canada. So I left Mozambique when I was one. But when I finished university, I did a biology degree and then I did a naturopathic medicine degree. I decided to go back to my home country because I was interested in working in the nutrition field in Mozambique specifically. Initially, I wanted to work with the impoverished society and mothers and babies. That was my goal. And as I've often told the story, that did not happen. Uh, it, it just wasn't meant to be, I guess. And so what I ended up doing initially against my will was I ended up opening a clinic in uh, uh, Maputo, the capital of Mozambique, where I was born. And I worked there for 10 years. And I led a very... Uh, a multidisciplinary clinic um, with uh, great uh, other doctors, uh, conventional doctors, uh, and myself, and we had a nice referral system, um, which really allowed me, because I was the only person doing this in Mozambique, um, privately, I had a private clinic for, for metabolic syndrome, so people that were interested in weight loss, diabetes, uh, cardiovascular help uh, through diet, so I had a lot of referrals from cardiologists, gastroenterologist, gynecologist, you name it. So it was a very nice working environment. And I worked for 10 years with lots and lots of people. And as, as I often say, I wasn't prepared for it. I wasn't trained for it. But people were wonderful, accepting, and wonderful guinea pigs in Mozambique. And they were willing to learn with me. I also had no restrictions. I had no guidelines. And so I, I very early on figured out and realized that people did best with a low carb diet. I had nobody telling me that I couldn't tell them to follow a low carb diet. So in a real food diet. So that was right from the get go. Something super interesting that, I, and I was a young, you know, this was, I, I went to Mozambique when I was 25 years old. And I was this young, uh, eager to learn sort of person. And I was working with amazing people. And so one thing that was super interesting in my journey, and you mentioned somebody who, uh, somebody that we both know, that uh, in, in his practice also saw this, was that a lot of people that had struggled with fertility after following this uh, diet for metabolic health were getting pregnant. Uh, or people who had struggled with fertility and had tried uh, fertility treatments and IVF and were unsuccessful, all of a sudden were getting pregnant without trying. Uh, later in life, late 20s in, in their, into their 40s. So I had a lot of these uh, stories. Remember, because I was very lucky to be in a place where I was the only one doing this. So I had a huge sort of um, group of people that I worked with. Um, I got to see lots and lots of people. And there was a lot of, it wasn't an N equals one sort of thing. It was a, it was a recurrent thing uh, that women were getting pregnant, even when they weren't they weren't able to get pregnant before or um, in, in, of course, word of mouth. So, so much so that it became a running joke. Don't go see Dr. Natty unless you want to get pregnant. And at the time, to be honest with you, I didn't actually have a great explanation. 
for them. But it was known. It was known that this diet could help fertility, this lower carb diet, this real food diet. And we often said it was because of uh, the detox. So it was like a body cleanse sort of thing. You're eating healthier, your body's cleansing, and this is why people are getting pregnant. Either way, I wasn't a fertility doctor, and that wasn't my focus. So I didn't have to give people many explanations. It was just a side effect of the diet. And my focus was primarily, and still is, metabolic syndrome, helping people improve their metabolic health through diet. So that's how my story started. At some point in Mozambique, of course, I got married, and I started trying to conceive. And a year and a bit later, I wasn't pregnant. So I started to get concerned, of course, as, as, as women do and couples do when they want to have a baby. That's your first and foremost, most important thing. And after a year, you, you are classified as infertile. So I started picking and prodding at my doctor in South Africa, because I, even though I lived in Mozambique, I saw a doctor in South Africa, uh, to find out why I wasn't pregnant. And I, and I thought I had PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome, but he completely dismissed it because I was thin, I was very thin. When I, when I went to Mozambique, I weighed, I think, 46 kilos, which is like 90 something pounds, uh, fully grown adult, but I was very, very thin. So, and I was on the pill for many years, over 10 years, because as a teenager, I guess I had a lot of concerns and my doctor thought that that was the way to go, was to give me the pill. My concerns were never addressed, but the pill masked these things. So I wasn't diagnosed with PCOS then, even though I should have been. But basically, I had irregular cycles, uh, severe acne, and hirsutism, which is uh, hair growth. And so I was put on the pill, and it helped manage those symptoms. But when I tried to get pregnant, of course, the pill wasn't going to help me. So when I got off the pill, all of these symptoms resurfaced. So irregular periods, no ovulation. I did have a period still, but I, didn't, I wasn't ovulating. The acne was tremendously bad. A hirsutism, so the hair growth, and uh, male pattern baldness. And I started to gain a ton of weight in a very short period of time. But because I was so thin, it wasn't noticeable to others. And most of my weight was around my midsection. So I knew enough to uh, question whether I had PCOS. And he said, no, no, no. But eventually I convinced him, and it was private healthcare after all, I could convince him to do all kinds of testing and uh, was diagnosed with a frank type of PCOS, meaning I had all, of, all three diagnostic criteria. So now we knew what the problem was. I knew what the problem was. And his solution, of course, was to recommend fertility treatments, Clomid, and sent me off, to, uh, which is an ovulation st uh, stimulator, an oral stimulator, and sent me off to take this medication. But I wasn't too happy about that, to be honest. And at the time, I thought, there's something here. If all these women got pregnant on this diet, even though I'm thin, I thought, right? But I had gained weight, remember, around my midsection. It just wasn't very obvious. I thought if all these women got pregnant following the strict low carb diet, I'm going to do it too. And of course I followed the diet, which I hadn't followed before. And I got pregnant the first time with my oldest, who's now nine. So that's how my journey began. And of course, between that first pregnancy and my second pregnancy, which was a lot tougher, actually getting pregnant the second time around was a lot tougher because like many women, I followed the low carb diet to get pregnant. But the minute I got pregnant, I bounced right off of it. I went back to eating a higher carb diet and snacking all day long, just like I did before. So the diet that got me to develop all of these concerns, unfortunately, because of lack of information, was the diet I got back to. So during my first pregnancy, I had severe pregnancy complications, pretty complicated postpartum period, and my cyst in my ovaries actually got worse, and I had to have some emergency uh, surgeries to remove one of them got to be seven centimeters and had to be surgically emergency removal so between one pregnancy and the other my metabolic syndrome got a lot worse and i gained tons of weight um and it never got resolved because i only followed the diet short term to get pregnant i got pregnant very easily on this diet as many people with pcos do but i didn't resolve the problem i just got pregnant i just got my body i, I lowered my insulin enough to be able to ovulate and get pregnant but then i didn't follow through I didn't know to. By my second pregnancy, of course, it was a lot tougher. The fertility medication didn't work. Um, I had a friend, a gynecologist, who uh, connected the dots for me. She's actually the one that said, remember that you have PCOS, so you're insulin resistant. The Clomid, the ovulation medication, might not work. You need, uh, you should take metformin, she said to me. Metformin, is, as you know, Doug, is a diabetic medication. It's, it's a medication that helps uh, your cells become more sensitive to insulin. 
and I took the metformin and I got pregnant. And so after that, I had to connect the dots between why the first diet worked, why the metformin worked. It was insulin. It's insulin. It's insulin. It's, in, it's insulin. As, as, as I often say, as Dr. Fung says, as we say in our book, if the problem is insulin, then the solution is to lower insulin. And we know how to lower insulin, right? We talk about this at your conferences and all over the place. This is our focus. This is the link between PCOS and diabetes and obesity and, hyper, and, and a lot of other associated metabolic conditions, right? And PCOS is right in there. It's part of this group of symptoms or expressions, as we were talking about, Doug, of this underlying disease, which is insulin resistance. PCOS is just an expression, just like all the other conditions. And so if women have PCOS, whether they're overweight or not, whether they're trying to get pregnant or not, we must help them to realize this and lower their insulin through diet and intermittent fasting. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that you're saying is about um, people not being overweight, um, that we see that with a lot of these other metabolic conditions is that it was originally associated with obesity or, or, or overweight or excessive weight. But more and more people are, are presenting with these metabolic conditions that aren't overweight. And it's, and that's okay. So it's almost like, and uh, you know, I've heard other docs in the field and they talk about it where it's weight is almost just like a, a side effect of the metabolic condition that, 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 that they've actually developed. The underlying one is insulin resistance that underlies all of them. And then it, it shows its face as some kind of a metabolic disease. And obesity is kind of something, in fact, one of the docs even said to me, Doug, you know, no one ever died of being fat. They died of, of the underlying condition that made them fat, basically. Um, so that's really interesting. So one of the things that I would like to, uh, to go back to is... Um, the, how quickly it, 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 so you said you took this, uh, you, you started doing this diet and suddenly you got pregnant. And I think that's not just with this, but with any of the conditions that, that uh, this way of life seems to address is how quickly people respond when they actually start doing it. So I'm interested to hear the time frame for you from the time you actually started doing it till the time you actually were able to feel, to feel pregnant. How long? How long was that? It was always less than two months. So both times. Wow. And this is after over a year of trying both times. So in the second time, I actually took the, the fertility medication for the required six months and I didn't get pregnant. So the second time though, unfortunately, I did not follow the diet. I, I want that to be very clear. I, I followed it the first time because it was a connection that I made and it was something quick and easy enough for me to try. And, um, in my case, as I said, I had a cycle. I had a menstrual cycle, but I wasn't ovulating. So by following this, and I followed a very strict low-carb diet for about a, a month and a half to two months, and I, and I lost a lot of weight in that time, especially for my frame. I lost five kilos in that amount, or close to that, in that amount of time following this very low-carb diet. But what happened is that that lo insulin-lowering effect of this low-carb diet caused me to ovulate. So I had a cycle, but I wasn't ovulating. And so what we know now is that insulin is not only a, a metabolic or a hormone that has metabolic functions, it's a hormone that has reproductive functions and very important reproductive functions, okay? So insulin has, um, and, and there's two main mechanisms for this, but it basically impacts the liver and it impacts the, the, the ovaries in this case, to produce more or less of certain hormones that will affect your reproduction, all right? And other things, this, these male expressions, the expressions of, of male hormones. So what high insulin will do, particularly in the ovaries, is it keeps your follicles, your eggs, immature. They never mature enough to ovulate if insulin okay. is above a certain level. So I was able, through the diet, in a very quick period of time, to lower insulin enough in order to ovulate. And as soon as you ovulate, of course, you're you're at risk for getting pregnant, right? Right. Which is what happened with me. So I didn't reverse the condition. All I did was lower insulin enough through diet for a very short period of time to ovulate. I ovulated, I got pregnant. The second time, the same thing happened, but with metformin. 
Okay. I took metformin for a couple of months. It lowered my insulin, or at least it made my cells a little bit more sensitive to insulin, enough for me to ovulate. And metformin has been studied uh, widely for women with PCOS. Um, I just saw a recent study on, uh, so on pregnancy, I, there's, there's some studies on that too, but on young women that have no ovulation, so an ovulatory thin, lean women. So they wanted to take out the obesity factor. I just saw a study on this. And I, they took, I don't know what the exact number of girls was, was young girls, teenage girls. So not, not pregnancy is not a factor here, but they hadn't had a, um, ovulation. They might've had a cycle. Some of them did, some didn't, but they were not, they were an ovulatory, which is the problem here, right? Mm -hmm. You're not ovulating because the high insulin. So these were lean young women with PCOS, diagnosed with PCOS, higher levels of insulin. So they were put on metformin and they were, what they were checking with these young girls was how long it would take them to ovulate on metformin. And I think it was like 80 or 90% of them by six months ovulated, started to ovulate regularly. The great majority of them, it was in the first month or two. But that was, even in, the, in, in, in these uh, more insulin resistant cases, I guess it would take a little bit longer. So maybe the diet would take six months for you to ovulate and maybe metformin in some cases. But most uh, we're seeing in one or two months, you lower insulin a little bit and people are ovulating. Wow. Um, you talked about being back in, uh, in Mozambique and you had this clinic for 10 years. And you've obviously been back here or back in Canada for um, a long time since then. So it's, a, you know, keto and low carb has become all the rage um, in the last few years. But it seems like you're a bit like uh, Steve Finney, you know, like the, years ago, you were already recognizing that this was, um, that this was something to, to consider. So how did you how did you discover, how did you become aware of this back then, that, that, that this was a, a diet or a way of life that, that could help these women? It was um, trial and error, to be totally honest. I didn't have, I was all the way in Mozambique, as you said, I wasn't really uh, surrounded by the people that I'm surrounded by now uh, that know this. Um, it, was tr it was really trial and error. And the way that I did it was my initial diet, as I said, was a real food diet. It wasn't necessarily low carb. But then I would throw in these detoxes once a month that were strict low carb. And those are the things that were really causing people to lower their blood sugars and lower weight. But we were doing it kind of like in a cyclical pattern because I guess initially at the time we didn't really think uh, and people didn't really like the idea of low carb, right? There was all these thoughts around it. But when it became highly personal for me, when I realized this, again, in my first pregnancy, and I, I didn't make the connection between the first and second pregnancy, or I would have continued on the diet and killed myself. And made my second journey a lot easier, but I didn't know enough then. So it's not that, it's almost like I, I were, was connecting the dots along the way. So it's not like 10 years ago when I got pregnant with my first child, I, I knew, oh, PCOS, ketogenic diet, insulin resistance, I did not. It's along the way I was connecting the dots. It was obvious enough and important enough for me to have to connect the dots. And as I said, it was, so my second child, my, my youngest is six. And so it was when I was trying to get pregnant with my six-year-old that my friend, a uh, gynecologist, as I said, and she was trained in Madrid. And she said to me, remember that you have PCOS and, and you're insulin resistant. That's why you won't get pregnant even on Clomid if you can't ovulate. Right. And so again, this is in the medical literature. It is known that PCOS uh, is an insulin resistant condition. What we're lacking is the conventional treatment is not addressing that. There are symptomatic treatments, except for metformin, which has come in to, to really help. But what's the problem with using metformin or IVF or any of these other um, artificial uh, treatments for women with PCOS and helping them get pregnant? It's not addressing the root cause of the problem. It's not addressing hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance. Right. So and we were, sorry to interrupt. I mean, we okay. were, um, we were discussing this earlier is that um, even the fact that they have PCOS means that they have this underlying insulin resistance condition. They have metabolic syndrome and that makes them at risk for all these other metabolic um, diseases, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, um, 
down the road, Alzheimer's, all those sorts of things. Um, so they need to, it's not just about um, getting pregnant. It's about getting metabolically healthy as well. Absolutely, because of all of these as the very serious, as you said, associated conditions. Because as we've, as you've said, Doug, uh, earlier in this conversation, insulin resistance is a disease, right? Obesity is just an expression. PCOS is just an expression. Right. Diabetes is just an expression. So you need to treat the disease, the insulin resistance. Women with PCOS are not infertile. They might be anovulatory, meaning they might not be ovulating. But once you fix that, through artificial measures or by lowering insulin, they get pregnant. But if you don't resolve the underlying insulin resistant concern, they are at risk for very serious, just like I was, pregnancy complications. You have uh, preeclampsia, eclampsia, pregnancy related hypertension, gestational diabetes, miscarriage is huge in women with PCOS. So they get pregnant, but then they miscarry often. And then there's a Another uh, important factor, the babies, the fetus and uh, the babies of these women are susceptible to a higher risk of neonatal morbidity and mortality. And again, this is documented, not stuff that's not out there. It's there in the medical literature. So we must encourage these women with PCOS. We must tell them, yes, it's an easy solution. Yes, you can resolve your issue, but not artificially. You must resolve PCOS. You must reduce this insulin and resolve the metabolic concerns as well before and then, you get pregnant. And then keep the insulin down, right? So exactly. it's not a matter of doing this like almost like you did, just get pregnant and then and then all bets just are like off, I you know? Did. Just like I did and just like many women still do. I work yeah. with thousands of women and they are very happy to get pregnant, but many of them disappear. Unfortunately, I've had quite a few come back because they now develop gestational diabetes and, and, and I often refer them to somebody who I respect who works with pregnant women and that have gestational diabetes. But this often happens. They follow the diet and the ketogenic diet and intermittent fasting to get pregnant and then they're off many times because they don't know what to do during pregnancy. Right. That's really cool and interesting. Um, so tell us um, a bit about this new book that you've come out to, to finish off here. Um, tell us how people can get hold of you and um, how they can get hold of this book and what the book's about and, and how they can get hold of it. Awesome. Will do. So our book is called The PCOS Plan, Prevent and Reverse Polycystic Ovary Syndrome Through Diet and Fasting. I wrote the book with Dr. Jason Fung, who most people here probably have, uh, know of very well. Um, I work, as I said, for the fastingmethod.com. I'm a coach uh, for our program. And so you can uh, reach me there anytime. I do provide one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching for women uh, with fertility concerns, but also uh, men and women with, with metabolic syndrome, diabetes, obesity, et cetera. So we have a, a wonderful uh, fasting and real food sort of dietary program. Um, our book is, is out already. It's available on Amazon. There's an audible version. There is a Kindle version and there's a paperback version of it. Um, I think it's currently available for immediate order in North America. So Canada and the US. I think the UK is next sometime between, I'm not sure, but uh, it's been changed slightly. I think because of uh, the, the, the virus. Um, I, I think it's now uh, supposed to be out in may or july uh, i haven't been it hasn't been confirmed to me but it's it will come out but the kindle and the audible versions are available immediately in those other countries and there's a there you were saying there's a bit of a delay maybe by the time this <clears throat> excuse me maybe by the time this thing airs um you know some of the, the the problems with deliveries and stuff like that would will be getting better um i'm really hoping that's the case um but if if if, uh, if you don't want to wait, then get it on Kindle or get it on Audible. And, uh, and that way you get it straight away, right? Absolutely. It's, it's such a, I was saying to you earlier, Doug, it's such a common condition. It's the most common endocrine and hormonal condition in women. So often when I do talks, um, I, I start by asking how many of you, have, how many of you have heard of PCOS and everybody raises their hand. I have, Tons of gentlemen come and speak to me after because their daughter has PCOS, their wife has PCOS, their mother, sister, you know, patients, whoever, uh, because it's, it's the most common endocrine concern. 
And as Dr. Fung says uh, in our book and everywhere else, if it was just about a little bit of acne and a few missed periods, it wouldn't be a big deal, but it's a huge deal. It's a very serious and debilitating condition that needs to be addressed and can so easily be addressed. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's awesome that we, we actually have such an easy solution as well. So thank you so much for uh, taking the time to, to be with us and tell us all about this. Um, it's a pleasure and I hope we see you at uh, one of our very, few, um, but we're hoping that we're going to have another conference sometime soon. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and, and hopefully we see you there. Thanks so much. I, I hope so, Doug. Stay well. Okay. You've been listening to an episode of the Low Carb USA podcast. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash lowcarbusa.